Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. I'm your host, Ethan Drew, and we're back for another episode of the Vocast. This is going to be my second podcast with a familiar face. Say, hey, Mr. Peter. What's up, guys? Peter here. Happy to be back. For those of you who do not know who he is, he is an opera singer of several years, bass vocalist, music producer, and electronic music producer as well. If you have not heard his work, you need to go check him out. I'll have his information in the description below. He's a very close friend of mine ever since I've kind of breached out here in the music industry, and I'm excited to have him back to kind of give us a little bit of a chat on some things that we would like to be chatting about over here at the music industry so if you like hearing musicians ramble on about stuff youtube wise and music wise in the industry make sure you drop a like hit drop a comment down below subscribe if you are not subscribed yet there's a lot of viewers who are not yet subscribed so make sure you hit that button if you want to be notified when we release podcasts and other videos like this without with that said Let's dive right in. So, do you have anything that you are drinking today? I know we kind of start off light and we do that over here at the podcast. I am. So, actually, I've been starting my mornings with organic celery juice a little bit. And then I'll have like some kind of hydration supplement. So, this is, I don't know if you've heard of Noon Energy, N U U N. And you just drop a little hydration pellet in your water. And it's a, it's a great way to start the day. Noon. I don't believe I've heard of that. Well, Maybe I've heard of it, but I don't know that I've ever had it myself. It's like the cheapest one you can get. Most hydration pack supplements are like over a dollar, dollar fifty per dose. This is you can get a little pack of ten for usually like five or six dollars. Really? Yep. And I will be drinking coffee after this chat. <laughs> oh yes. I uh, today's blend is um, Seattle's best post alley. It's a very dark, smoky blend. I'm a fan of dark coffee. Pretty much, pretty much the darker, the better. And just drink it black. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. I am so sorry. We are doing this episode while being sick, but this is or Peter is a very busy man, and I wanted to get this podcast in the books. And my voice is in good enough shape that I felt we could get it knocked out. So apologies if you hear any gross noises. I will do my best to mute them out. <laughs> but I am anyway. healthy. The, ho the host is uh, extra bassy today. <laughs> yeah. You guys, my voice is not usually this deep. As most of you know, I am a bass baritone, not a bass. So I am not usually this rich in the mornings. So, yeah. Just bear with me. <laughs> I'm sure but, no um, one's gonna have a pro no one's gonna have a problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> question for you uh, regarding coffee before we kind of start diving into things. So, what are your thoughts on like dressing up a coffee, just like in general? I'm personally not a fan of it. I really like the taste of just black coffee. Uh, it's cheaper that way for me. I feel the caffeine more if they're if it's not, uh, you know, drowned out in milk or or cream or whatever. And um, it yeah. kind of it kind of becomes <clears throat> desserty. And I've always used coffee. I mean, I like I really like the taste now. I think it's it's been more acquired. I really like the taste of coffee now. But for so long, I really just used it for for productivity. And there's something about just a a bitter hot cup of black coffee that really makes me want to like dive in and work on stuff. And if I get some big desserty latte, that, that feeling is no longer there. That then it becomes, <laughs> then it becomes a leisure, a leisurely activity. Me personally, I'm in this kind of the same boat. Like I will, I will drink it. Cause the fiance, she, she loves that kind of coffee and she'll drink multiple cups. If you let her, uh, she, she, she's kind of gotten me into being a bit of a home, home barista now. She's oh, wanting cool. to she's wanting to open up a storefront of a coffee shop at some point over here close to where we live. And in the meantime, so I'm sure you've probably been to these, but have you ever been to like a pop up tent event, like vendor events in like a small yeah. town? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Where 
talking about doing something like that to kind of get our feet up under us and see how the customer base looks. Because in the town that I live in, there's not a single coffee shop. It's the next town over. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. yeah. How many people are in your town? What's the population of your town? <clears throat> uh, just a small few thousand. That's enough for a coffee shop. Yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> and she was telling me the other day about a friend of hers that was actually up here that where someone had a, a coffee food truck, right? And they were parked up in like one of the post offices up here close by. And I didn't know, but apparently the people that were there were ranting and raving about there not being a shop up here. So the, uh, the crop is ripe. It sounds like, yeah, that sounds like an entrepreneur opportunity. Yeah. But uh, all that aside, uh, dark coffee, I don't know what it is, but it's also been an acquired taste for me. It's just something about drinking something super bitter and warm that just energizes me and makes me want to do something. Yep. Absolutely. Do you, do you drink coffee on an empty stomach or do you have a meal with it? I don't. So I actually usually skip breakfast. Um, I don't. Well, I've kind of changed my eating habits a little bit. I don't really treat it as a designated meal kind of thing. I just usually eat when I'm hungry. Mm-hmm. And I'm mm-hmm. never, I'm never hungry in the mornings. So I tend to just drink coffee in the mornings just to give my daily dose of energy. It works better that way. Yeah, I in agree. my experience, it works. I, my energy is much better and much cleaner and much more sustained if I have an empty stomach. Mm-hmm. I know some people can't do that because the coffee on an empty stomach uh, bothers them. It oh, yeah. irritates their stomach, but, but, but for me, that's never, never been an issue. Yeah, I know that. I know that's an issue for a lot of people. The um, I was trying to think of something else that I was going to say. So there was, I don't, I do, I only eat whenever I'm hungry. So I, that means I don't usually end up eating very much. So if I ever need the energy, my two go tos are getting up out of the bed and going straight outside the moment I wake up. And then after that, I I just plan on getting my black coffee down in me. Morning sunlight is is really good, really healthy. Um, For another any- trick, another trick. If you really, if you if you want to get rolling and you don't want to give yourself a choice, cold shower. Oh my goodness, the psychological effect, <laughs> the positive psychological effect. I can't speak today that it has on me whenever I don't want to get up or do anything for the day. It is unmatched. It's like it's documented too. It's it, it it gets your dopamine system spiked in a really healthy way for hours and hours. Oh my goodness! Uh, if, if you if you can really torture yourself in the cold for a couple of minutes, it's amazing what it does to your day, dude. It is crazy, and I I remember you probably got the information from the same place I did, but I remember watching the Huberman Huberman Lab podcast, and yeah, bingo. see, bingo, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> see. We're both fans of that podcast, guys, and I take the information how you want and listen to what you want. But um, in my experience, yeah, in my experience, it's very good information because there is one podcast. We'll kind of segue into how this integrates into the, the actual voice. But there was one podcast in particular that you actually mentioned to me in our first podcast, which was the one where it was talking about sleep and circadian rhythm. I've, yeah. yeah. You, and ever since I have listened to his podcast on that, I have not slept the same since. I sleep like a rock the majority of the time. You're getting that morning sunlight. You were just mentioning that. It's a really yeah. critical factor. The morning sunlight, making sure I cut out the blue light like an hour before bed, not doing anything, engaging, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, caffeine not within like twelve hours. Of going to sleep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it works, man. It works. That's what's great about his podcast is you can you can test his methods in real time. It is the coolest thing ever, and obviously, it's like I said before. You take the information we give you with a grain of salt and do your own research, of course. But in my personal experience, it works really well, and it's simple stuff. Yeah, simple stuff, and something that I always like to add in these podcasts if we start talking about anything remotely anatomy or medical related i always get this disclaimer out of the way folks 
we are not medical doctors or f licensed practitioners. Always take a doctor's advice over someone over the internet. But anyway, um, yeah, so I mean, the effects that that's had on not only my health in general is, but my vocal health has been profound. Because yeah, sleep is critical. Sleep is absolutely critical. In your experience, I don't, I don't know if you've experienced this much, but I know my experience. Ever since I started getting that sleep, I started having much better vocal quality. I, when I would go to record something, my voice would feel more full. I would get more closure. I would feel less exhausted. Yeah, I would say almost all the time it's a direct a direct one-to-one -one with how well you're sleeping, how well you're hydrating, and how, how those two things especially affect the voice. There are, there are days, we've all had days where you might have gone out partying or whatever and you'd expect your voice to be terrible and then your voice the next day is just gold. And there are days when you <clears throat> sleep really well and you're really well hydrated and the voice is just terrible. So you can, you can, there's no guarantee for the voice just because it's a part of our anatomy, it's a part of our bodies. It's changing all the time with whatever you're eating, whatever you're drinking, your hormones, everything affects the voice. But for the most part, if you're sleeping well and you're really well hydrated, the voice is going to respond properly. Yeah, and that's something that I feel like is discounted in our current music culture is the v true value of intaking the amount of water you need and intaking the amount of sleep you need in order for the maximum vocal quality. Yeah, I agree. And water also changes based on climate. Like I'm at Arizona Opera in Phoenix and these guest artists come in, you know, they fly in for performing in these shows with us. And um, they often have to drink, you know, nearly twice as much water since they're now in the desert and then there's no humidity. And that has a huge effect on the vocal folds as well because humidity and moisture is really how the vocal folds function their best. So if they're dried out from the desert climate, you're not going to have nearly as good access to certain parts of your vocal range. Absolutely. <clears throat> that brings me into some, uh, a useful little tool that I've been using very frequently over the last week that I've been sick, but it's also good for not say vocal steamer. Yes. Oh, it's a lifesaver. Oh, you mean like a, a personal one? Yes. Yes. Yep. So yep. the one I have, I'll take the top half. Um, this is just an El Cheapo Vix that I get at Walmart, but this, <laughs> did, but did, did, no if shot. You see, if you can see back there, it's the same one. No shot. Yeah. So guys, <laughs> if you, <clears throat> so if you guys are needing or looking into vocal steamers or just steamers in general, these are fairly cheap and they work really well. And they're really good for hydrating your vocal cords as well as breaking up whatever you got going on in your vocal tract. That particular one is the best cheap model I've found. What's your experience in any other models? Well, I have a lot of, I haven't gotten, well, actually, I've tried a number of the cheap models because there was, there was an old version, an old CVS model that worked really, really well. And then they stopped producing it for some reason. And so I went through probably three or four years of just quality. The, the quality is just not as good. The steaming's just not as efficient. And uh, finally, then the Wix came out with it, or Vix came out with this, this new one, this new cheap model, which works really well. I have some yeah. friends who've done the really expensive ones, the <clears throat> handheld ones. <clears throat> oh yeah. Like $150 that you can take on airplanes and stuff. Um, I haven't tried those before. I've never needed to. I try to not rely on it. I usually only use the steamer if I'm if I'm sick and I need to perform, or I just need a little extra vocal recovery. Sure. But otherwise, otherwise, I try not to be in the habit because I try not to need it as a crutch for performing. Absolutely. I know it has helped a lot, but if you use it too much, you'll eventually start leaning on it more than you probably should. Which is really easy to do as an opera singer when you're training heavily vocally every day. And it's always like, oh, well, I could use the steamer and it's going to help this next practice session. But exactly, you don't want to lean on it. So I don't recall. You told me in the last podcast. So how many hours do you typically end up, end up rehearsing on any given day? I'm usually 
like full on singing a couple hours. Um, rehearsals right now, because we're in the middle of Romeo and Juliet, are usually 10 a.m. to 5 or 6 p.m. with a lunch break. Yeah. Um, and I'm not always called for all of it. I'm playing <clears throat> Count, Count Capulet, so I'm Juliet's father. So I'm not in all the scenes like Romeo and Juliet are. But yeah. right now, probably, probably usually four or five hours of rehearsal a day, a couple hours of singing. And, and for those that don't know much about opera, I mean, if you're watching this video, you probably do know about opera because you know who Peter and I are. But if you are watching and you don't know what opera is, they sing full out. So the idea of singing four to five hours full out, that will, I'm sure that'll wipe you out. Yeah, big time. And you, you've got to be careful. Like in rehearsal, we do what's called marking, where for me, usually I just sing everything an octave down if my voice starts getting tired. Because um, opera parts are written pretty high. So it's pretty easy sure. for a lower voice to sing an octave down. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are definitely days you sing multiple hours and operatic singing fun fact for everyone watching uh we do not use microphones and we have to be as loud as a full orchestra and some uh, without, most of the times you have to overpower it right you have to be heard yeah <laughs> <laughs> you have to be heard throughout a lot i mean we were just performing um in phoenix and tucson and we will do the same for this show in 2300 seat venues yeah. with orchestra <laughs> with no microphones that's and I performed in uh, back in high school. I remember performing in little or in smaller. Forgive me for digging my eye out on camera, guys. Um, I remember <laughs> performing in venues of similar size, and to the idea that someone has to project their voice and be heard on the other side of auditoriums that big is pretty mind blowing to me from the from an outsider looking into opera. It is a, a shocking thing. I mean, it's the kind of thing where you don't really you can't really fully appreciate the size of the voice in a large space. To really feel it, you've got to be up close. And for me, like, you know, a couple of days ago we did a full musical run through of Romeo and Juliet. I've heard thousands of opera singers. I've heard hundreds and hundreds of yeah, at least hundreds of professional opera singers up close in person. And it still catches me off guard when I'm, you know, sitting next to someone in a rehearsal and they're singing full out. I am still to this day like, wow, that is loud. Like, am I that loud too? I am. <laughs> they're thinking the same thing because, you know, you're sending the voice, you're sending the voice forward, right? So if you're singing yeah. well, it's not going to feel loud to you. But the person next to you sounds very loud to you. <laughs> um it's a very it's subjective thing, right? It still it still surprises me after hearing so many singers. It's it's that loud. <laughs> and yeah, it, it it's pretty crazy. And I've I've been diving into it lately, and I've just been I'm more and more blown away by what opera singers are truly capable of in their voice as I've been listening through in my free time. And it's I have a newfound respect for you guys. <laughs> I really yeah, do. It's, if you can ever find a way to see hear an, a pro opera singer up close try to do that if there's like a recital or something in a small in a small space that's where you that's where you really want to see one i'm sure i could probably find one not far from where i live and i'm sure that i'll be able to pull that off pretty soon i plan to um come see one of yours at some point for those that don't know i've been trying to line up a time to go see one of his performances timing just has not worked out yet but it will at some point hopefully this year yeah, it's a big trip. Um, I just had a couple patrons fly in from Canada and Chicago to see a show, which was really cool. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, they came in for a Barber of Seville. Shout out. And um, we went out and got drinks after and got to, got to actually meet in person for the first time. They were, they were joking because I've technically met them before I've met Marwan in person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> Huh. Speaking of patrons, that's a good segue into one of the topics that I wanted to touch base with you on today. Um, so I wanted to kind of really dive into Patreon, the good and the bad and the ugly, as far as some of the mindsets that people may have and the reception that it may get from some viewers. Um, 
I kind of want to dive into the psychology of what Patreon is and what it and the purpose of what it is. So I have recently been called by people that will remain nameless, a couple of people, um, greedy just by mentioning Patreon. Um, so, mm -hmm. and with you, with you having been in the Patreon, um, a Patreon program of some description, what is it called again? The creator program? Amb the ambassador program, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So with you having, obviously having used Patreon longer than myself, been in that program, kind of, kind of explain to us what Patreon's like actual purpose is in layman's terms and we'll kind of dive into patreon as a whole a little bit further and yeah so patreon's a platform where fans of yours that you most likely acquired from a different platform like youtube or instagram can donate money monthly to your creativity <clears throat> and and your project so me for example um, I started my Patreon when I was making just acapella covers. This is before I was even doing analysis videos, and people wanted to throw a few dollars my way each month so that I could, you know, start increasing the production value of my projects. And sure. most people are there because they just want to support you. Most people don't care so much about the benefits, which is great. Those are the good people that you want supporting you. Some people will can get a little upset if, if a benefit is not met in time or something like that, but that's very few people. Most people just want to donate to your cause. I've had people say, listen, I just want to donate this much per month. Don't even worry about sending me merch. I just want to support you, right? Yeah. And in my opinion, Patreon is, is the best platform we have today as creators to facilitate that. Um, it's easy to direct people to it. It's easy for people to join. You can set up the tier structure however you want. Now there's a free option for people um, that just can join and kind of see what it's about for a little while without getting all the benefits. You mm -hmm. can connect to Patreon to your Discord server where you build that private community. Um, but essentially, yeah, it is a platform where people can donate to you as a creator to help you on your creative journey. Sure. And that's a really, I think that's a really good synopsis of what Patreon is and what its purpose is. And there are some key words in there that I would like to use to, if you will, like clear the air for anyone that may be in doubt. None of this in any way, shape or form is us demanding or asking you for money. This is a way for us to present you with an option to support us if you choose to be that generous. Yeah, it's leaving the door open. Um, yeah, and I think it's important for creators to plug their Patreon whenever they make content. I do it in every video. It's at the top of pretty much every video description I have. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, by the way, like I'm, I'm past this point now, but for a, for a long time, and I would say for most creators, probably never, you're probably not going to be making a, a, a full-time living just off YouTube. But Correct. as a small creator, even <clears throat> before you're monetized, you can get people supporting you on Patreon. Exactly. And if, you're, and if you're passionate about making, you know, creative projects part of your career, you need to have income supporting you, period. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Patreon's, like I said, I think the best platform for that. I'm in total agreement with you on that. It's a fantastic platform. The psychology behind it is great. I just felt that it was important to clear the air for some people to really understand the thought process behind it, the purpose of it, just so that way they could better understand, okay, this isn't greedy. This is just presenting an option and an opportunity for us to support them if we choose to. And at yeah. the end of the day, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt my feelings at all if you don't ever pay me a penny in my life. Just the fact that we have one viewer watching us I probably speak for both of us when I say one viewer that doesn't pay anything, one viewer we're still appreciative of. Of course, every single one. I have a funny story based on uh, platforms and support. So I, let's let's so, go for it. So you know how YouTube memberships are a thing now. Yeah, and yeah. you can you can offer different things on YouTube membership that you simply cannot offer on Patreon. Sure, like you know emojis in the chat chat priority yeah. being listed on the youtube channel in a certain way um now they have an option where you can actually let your 
YouTube members watch a premiere before the public premiere. Oh. So these are things you can't do on Patreon. Right. So I put out a little PSA to my Patreon. I was like, hey guys, memberships are now available on my channel. If you'd like to go check that out, you can get these benefits X, Y, Z that you, unfortunately, I cannot give you here if you'd like to find another way to support. Mm -hmm. <laughs> none, other, none other than the great Peter Hollins commented on, because he was a supporter of mine on Patreon for a while. Yeah. Uh, co I commented and kind of kind of roasted me for, for asking my <laughs> Patreon community to, to check out my YouTube memberships. <laughs> As opposed to just like asking people to support more on Patreon, and I, I had to explain to him that it was it was just because there are benefits I can't give people on Patreon that are available on YouTube membership. But mm -hmm. I thought it was it was actually kind of funny getting gr getting grilled by Peter Hollins. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually didn't know that you had a working relationship with Peter Hollins. That's actually really I, cool. I don't really. He started. He's we haven't had much interface, but he <clears throat> he was supporting me and Marwan on patreon for a couple of years he just i think he just kind of stopped supporting people on patreon recently um yeah i'm not sure why i still have an immense amount of respect for him i think i still think he's like the the father of online acapella music basically and and the bass gang is gonna see if we can work with him on something in the future but that um so i don't really have a relationship with him but he was supporting me on patreon for a while that's really cool and isn't that, is that not like a really cool feeling too, especially being in the acapella field and knowing that you're being not only acknowledged, but supported by one of the founding fathers of acapella? Yeah, I think there, there are a number of things like that that have been happening lately that are, are just like, wow, I, I really have, I really have come this far. This is very cool. I've been having several of those moments lately. I know you and I have discussed about someone in particular that I am working on getting on the channel. I'm not disclosing who that is yet to the audience, but I've been working closely with him on getting him to appear. That was one of my aha moments. Um, I also have another guest who I have confirmed will be making an appearance next week. And I'll mm. tell you who that is off camera, but okay. he I will give you a hint. He wrote the music for Pitch Perfect. So if you know who that is. I don't know who that is, but Pitch Perfect is, is a major, major film. So Yes, it is. Um, I'll tell you who it is off camera, but um, it that's another aha moment for me. It's just really whenever I've been... I've been making all these friends in this music industry. Everyone is so welcoming, and it's... I've just had several of those lately where I'm like, people are enjoying my content. People are listening to what I put out and people this big are talking to a lowly creator like me. What? <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of crazy. Yeah. The podcast is a good way to, what did I say? I've said before, like punch above your weight, sort of. Sure. Yeah. And you know. I, I feel like I've definitely been doing that lately because I've got so many wonderful people that I've had on here so far. And it's just truly humbling, too, to know that I've already come this far and I, I have still a ways to go yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you, heard of, have you heard of the group Straight No Chaser? They're one of the... Straight No Chaser. I feel yeah, like kind of, I have. They're kind, of one of the, they're kind of one of the OG acapella groups. Like I feel like I have. Probably really established. Um, <clears throat> do, hu they tour. They do on huge, huge tours, all that. Well, the... <laughs> This is a, a a pretty crazy one for me that happened recently. Uh, Tim, Tim Faust actually reached out to their music director and recommended me as a as a base to join them on tour and to like join their group. What? So so the guy from the guy from Straight No Chaser, <clears throat> I just get a text from him randomly. He's like, "Hey, just got a re recommendation from Tim Faust that you would be a great base to join us." <laughs> And I was like, "What? <laughs> wow, this is uh, this is unexpected and and very cool. I'm not going to be able to. The timing's not going to work out because I'm uh, under contract for opera stuff. But I had a nice nice long chat with with their music director on the phone for about half an hour, and then of course texted Tim. I was like, "Hey man, thanks for the recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. That's <laughs> that's humbling to say the least. You have one of the." Tri holy trinity if you will of acapella bases recommending you to another um goaded if you will acapella group yeah yeah it was very cool that had to have been pretty surreal 
It was a good feeling. Very good feeling. <laughs> Migrating on to another topic that I wanted to kind of really dive into is um, some of the pros and cons of just being the kind of creators that we are in the niche of YouTube that we find ourselves in, being that we focus on podcasts, our own music, and reaction slash analysis videos. So I kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on the just the general niche and what it's like being in this area of YouTube. Yeah, that's kind of like the, it's kind of the wild west. It's, it's getting, it's getting more and more established. I think it's, it's tricky doing all three because the reaction and analysis videos are always going to be the most popular pretty much. Sure. Um, yeah. Most, they're most likely to. Um, and if you do that, then sometimes the other stuff doesn't get as much attention because YouTube knows what to favor like it exactly. knows the kinds of videos that you put out that are popular so it might favor the reaction analysis stuff and not favor the, the interviews or the or the music videos even if they're of high quality sure um i have managed <clears throat> to find success in all three partly based on the guests and and whatever else and some of the music videos are uh quality high quality enough to kind of breach that sure but um the low-hanging fruit is the reaction analysis stuff yeah, that's I mean, been the, my experience too. The really low hanging fruit is just reaction videos, and fortunately, we've taken it a step further. Um, and really, Elizabeth from the Charismatic Voice has has led the charge on building this kind of channel because she was the first to kind of do the analysis videos and the interviews and her own music videos, and that has become a really good model, I think, to follow. If you can put out all three of those things in high quality. I would say the way where it gets synergistic is that if you have music videos out, then people can see you're also a musical creator, which gives you more credibility when mm -hmm. commenting on the reaction analysis stuff. And the reaction analysis stuff can feed off the interviews if you're interviewing some of the guests that you're making reaction and analysis videos for. Sure. And so that ended up working out to your benefits in cases like Jeff, for instance. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. A number of them. I mean, uh, Tim, Jeff, Matt Salee from, from Pentatonix, mm -hmm. um, Ekaterina, uh, Lauren Paley, Melinda, like all, all these people, all these like really big creators that like, they're so big, you can make popular reaction videos for their music. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can kind of, uh, feed them off one another. It's something I'm doing. I'm trying to do more lately <clears throat> is, is, is time a reaction and analysis video kind of with the the timing of the release of an interview so i can release the interview and then the next day or a few days later be be like hey there's you know reaction analysis video i just interviewed this person go check out this interview of the person i'm that's to right now that's genius so we'll see how that we'll see how that strategy plays out As, to me it sounds like a great idea but then again i'm less experienced in that area so it can't I guess hurt. We'll see. I'll, I'll say that. It can't hurt. Yeah, of course. And that's also in when it goes back to just being in this niche of real of the YouTube era is that I found something, too, is that we all seem to have something in common while we're definitely different from each other is that I know that my my channel's mission is to truly just cultivate the love for music through through any avenue I can possibly provide. And mm -hmm. I feel like while that may be my specific mission statement, that may be your mission statement in a more, in a, in a different way. I feel like we all share the same mission statement in that era. Yeah. I area. think anyone doing, <clears throat> anyone taking the time to do the analysis videos feels that way. I know Elizabeth's her, her, her catchphrase is may you fall more in love with music every day yes that's like that's like her thing so that's her and yeah i've always said my channel is just to come just enhance everyone's music appreciation and especially appreciation for the artists absolutely like really helping people understand like <clears throat> what makes what makes dimash so special like why is that such a cool voice what mm -hmm. does he do that other singers can't do and in, in my experience that just will you'll still enjoy the music just as much and you'll just kind of understand a bit more why these successful artists are so successful and why people are so crazy about them. And it's fun to exactly. think about. Exactly. And it's, it's just, I, I love this niche of YouTube. 
where I feel like I'm not limited to reaction analysis because people do watch these on a pretty regular basis, at least now. But it's just a wonderful thing to be where we're at because it's, it's cultivating and it's growing. And we have several people to thank for that, obviously. Yeah, no, it's it's great. And I, I love the interviews, too. I mean, I love I love talking to people and, and and digging into what has made them who they are. And yeah, I mean, it's it's given me the ability to chat with Tim and Jeff and <clears throat> and and Matt. And there's some very, very, very cool guests coming up as well. I have um, been seeing some of the ones that you've been releasing and I have I have very high hopes. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's. It's cool who you, who you get access to as your platform grows. So, yeah, um, without a doubt, I, I love it too. And I also love making like I'm I'm working on my own music as well right now. A lot of my own music. Um, it's it's towards the bottom of the totem. Like really, my top priorities are opera and YouTube channel. Those have to be the top. Yeah, and right up there, just below, is bass gang stuff. Yeah, right. Um podcast is just below that probably and it's pretty easy to put out a video every two weeks for the podcast sure um and then below that's my own music so if i have extra time beyond those kind of four main components then i'm producing my own music and recording my own music and yeah hopefully we'll be putting out an album this year sometime yeah and i'm excited to hear that i know you guys probably are in the audience so make sure you stay tuned for that and it's like i said at the beginning of the video i'll have all of his info in the description. But most of you that are here listen, listening to this right now, listening to us ramble, probably already know who we are and probably enjoy our content already. <laughs> one so, would think so one would think so anyway, which is also a good segue into something else that I wanted to talk about in our field of YouTube and music. Um, just hate comments toxicity in general <laughs> across the board mm -hmm. now this is always a fun topic and a mm -hmm. delicate topic but i i was wanting to know how you deal with toxicity in in other creators if you found it at all or it just a toxicity from the audience from any avenue what are your thoughts on on it and how do you respond to it in this niche of YouTube Toxic and music. To toxicity from other creators I have not felt, fortunately. Good. Um, I haven't either. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't think it would really bother me, but haven't felt it from, from other creators. Um, and hate comments is the most common thing you're going to get on YouTube. And when I was, when I was starting out, they bothered me a lot because I wasn't, wasn't used to that, you know, mm -hmm. going, through, going through music school and all these other things where you're just getting praise all the time mm -hmm. for 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 being a talented singer yeah and then you get these trolls that just want to tear you down um used to bother me a lot they really don't i mean there are there are certain kinds of comments that bother me the, the one where people are just hurling insults in my direction don't bother me at all those bounce off no problem yeah the ones the ones that that still do bug me are when <laughs> people who are completely wrong just objectively wrong about something mm -hmm. to do with the music or how a music video is made. Like people who are like, oh, Pentatonix doesn't lip sync their music videos. I'm like, yes, 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 they do. And, 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 and the, the confidence at which they <laughs> present that argument, like they're, they're sure they're right. They're so sure they're right and that I don't know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. That annoys me because that's a form of condescension and condescension is my, is, is, is my number one pet peeve with people. It's I, so, there it's was, just... I was just going to say there's, there was one reaction video of yours where it was very, you were like very passionate about it. And I, I was laughing so hard whenever I was listening to you talking about it because I was pretty sure that I know all the comments that I had seen on your videos about it. It was um, voice plays cover of Valhalla Calling. You went on like a maybe like a two minute tangent on it. And I loved every second of it because I remember reading some of these comments and I was like, go get them. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, you know, have you heard of, have you heard of the Dunning Kruger effect? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you can throw up a graph or something on the screen, but it's basically yeah. when you, when you, 
when you start learning about a subject, like before you really know anything about it, you're really confident about, or it's a fallacy that people fall under. The, the people are really confident about this subject, right? And then as they start to learn more about it, they start to realize how much they don't really know about it until <laughs> they feel like they know nothing about it. And uh, then, it. <clears throat> from there, it comes back up as you study and you learn more and more and more. <coughs> the but the, the crazy thing about the Dunning-Kruger effect is that the confidence you have, even after all this research, never reaches how confident you were right at the beginning. <laughs> and so that's, so that's what all these people are, are falling under. They're like, I've seen a music video. This is obviously not lip synced when they don't actually know anything about how music videos are made or the music industry or audio production or anything like that. <laughs> I can tell you with confidence, the internet is chock full of those people that have this effect actively running in their lives. Yeah, I, th I think the YouTube comment section is, is, is like the holy grounds for for these people that come together, I really do. I really think so too. <clears throat> I have, I will also admit, I will kind of like to go into some of the more popular hate comments that's, that we like to get and something that we could quickly like kind of respond to and just kind of like in a positive fashion while they may be technically negative, but they're like, they may offer a solution or things of that nature. I know one of the ones that I tend to get ever since I changed the format of the videos, you stop too much. Now, Peter and I both are in the same boat now where we both stop to talk about the music on a regular basis. Now you can kind of hear, I'll let you kind of chat on how or why we decide to do that. And the logic behind it and i'll add to it as as we see fit yeah so we do reaction and analysis videos so like we said earlier our goal is not just to be entertaining purely it's also to be educational i very much view my videos like music lessons and so to do that like so i'll get a comment to piggyback off that where it's like you know why don't you watch the whole thing and then comment or you need to stop pausing you should watch the whole thing and then comment very simple answer. If you watch the whole thing, you will never, ever in a million years remember all the details that you want to comment on. Because there's so much going on. There's so much going on. So you could, like, what I do for the bass gang is I'll watch all the way through because it's so near and dear. I want to I wanna have the experience of watching my own group all the way through. And then sure. I'll go back and comment. <clears throat> you could do that for other videos as well, but I much prefer to just go... I think there is, is a, a, there's kind of a Goldilocks zone of how much you want to be pausing and commenting. So what I'll try to do lately, unless something really gets me, is I'll try to very uh, specifically, you know, pause after a verse and talk basically about everything I can remember from the verse or go yeah. back and maybe watch through it again. And then like do the same, like go section by section as opposed to just pausing every few seconds, which I did when I first started making videos. Mm -hmm. That seems to be a good zone where you can still plug enough analysis and you're not pausing so much that people get turned off by it. Yeah, people sure. always will. There's always going to be a subset of people that are, that are upset about whatever you're doing. But mm -hmm. that seems to be a, a pretty good method. But that's why we do it. We want to we educate while we entertain. Yeah, and we, we, we don't mean to interrupt your experience. And if you feel like it's interrupting, a good way for you to really not feel like it's interrupting is for you to go back and listen to the original yourself and then come to our videos. Yes, exactly. That's, <laughs> that's a fun, that these comments don't bother me really, truly 99% of the comments. I don't even think about or respond to, mm -hmm. but what, one, that one that still just makes me scratch my head. They'll be like, why do you keep pausing? I want to hear the original. I want to hear the singer sing. I'm like, then go watch the original video. That, that's why are you? Why have you clicked on a thirty-minute analysis video when analysis is in is in capital letters in the title? Like that's, you've you've got to know what you're signing up for. You you, you would have to know, right? I I have had some people. It's it's like I'm in the same boat as you in the sense that I I let all the insulting comments just roll off my back. I don't care. But at the end of the day, like I, I did want to make like a passing mention to some of these like 
less toxic comments, but still overall negative and just kind of make a mention as to why we do the things the way that we do them. So that way people can probably understand better. Yeah, I mean, my, my stance now is if, if you don't like the analysis and you don't like the pausing, then my content's not for you, and that's fine. There's tons of reaction channels that don't do that. Exactly. You know? I'm in the same boat, and it's it's not like me saying, hey, go watch someone else because blah, blah, blah. Just, it's not, it's not necessarily an aggressive response. It's just my content is not geared towards you if you don't like stopping and you don't like talking about what's going on in the music. Yep, exactly. I'll give you I'll give you a tip that I that I use sometimes, which I think is is really effective. If someone's really rude in a comment, just like really mean, really nasty, you pin that comment and you respond <laughs> to it very politely and understanding. <laughs> and it just makes them look a hundred times as bad. And it makes mm -hmm. you look very good. I did this on my uh, analysis video for zombie by the cranberries. Probably Ooh. the 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 most it's a wild comment. You should go check it out. Oh, yeah. And I'm I, going to. And, now. I, and I penned that comment and then responded very eloquently to it. <laughs> At the end of the day, when it comes to toxicity in general, I don't ever respond to it. I, I, like as a whole, I, we kind of looked into it, dive, dove into some of it. But like if we look at it as a general thing. I don't respond to it at all. And the ones that I feel like might remotely have some value or the ones that are insulting or whatever, I just sit there and I look at it. Have you ever seen uh, David Goggins? Of course. Yeah. Legend. Um, Legend. I do, I do something that he does in the sense that he mentioned something one time, I believe it was on a podcast where he takes like hate comments and like Chris record Williams's podcast. Yes, takes hate comments, records them, and plays them in his head as he's going to the gym or something, if yeah. I recall correctly. And yeah. I do some semblance of that. I will actually look at some of these hate comments. I will read them over and over and over again and find something valuable in it to better my content. So while not only am, am I not feeding into it, I'm using it to better myself. That's great, man. That that's a really a really good approach. Yeah, I I completely agree. I'd say ninety nine plus percent of the time, it's way better to just let them go, let them roll off. Sometimes I think it's good to make an example of one of them because that is actually important for people to see what is kind of unacceptable. Um, and then yeah, use them as use them as motivation if that works. Yeah, and I know that helps me a lot. I know it helped me when I first started because I was like you when I first started back in November 22. I was just like every hate comment got through to my head and yeah. I knew that was going to destroy me if I didn't, I felt wasn't careful. Yeah, you have to, to be a YouTuber, you have to get past that. Um, <clears throat> I had one other thing I wanted to say. Oh yeah, also, I've shifted my frame. I mean, the people who are, the people who get that upset and are mean and nasty in the comment sections. It's really not about you. It's about something going on in their lives. They're clearly upset. They're having a tough time. Mm -hmm. And this is their way of kind of releasing that anger because mm -hmm. you're some, some stranger that they can take it out on without repercussion. Mm -hmm. And so when I get these nasty comments, I also try to think of, you know, more have empathy for the people who are if, if if something if something like pausing a video makes you that upset there's obviously a lot more going on that, obviously that we, that we don't see so i think it's helpful to to view it in that light as well that's something that i've i've done before I, this was before youtube i would just i would get a nasty comment about something and that was a way i used to approach it instead of just flat out like dismissing the comments uh even mentioning it i would just say are you okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah yes exactly it's a it's a form of projection mm -hmm. and that's a also a good segue into another thing that i did want to mention um with the community so something that i have experienced i don't know if you have or not but i wanted to see what you thought about 
your audience's content desires versus the content you enjoy and how often those paths diverge. Mm. Yeah. And really, um, really think, bouncing I, that. <clears throat> I think my audience is, is big enough now to where the people who have found me are here for what I do. Sure. You know, no, no one is, I don't think anyone is subscribing to my channel that just wants peer reaction videos. Um, so from, from my community, it is, it is very much all support there. I mean, I did a poll the other day that was like, should I do more analysis? Should I do less analysis? Right now it's perfect. Sure. Like those are the, those are the three <clears throat> options. And I, and thousands of people responded. Thousands of people. Like yeah. Three or 4,000 people. And I think like, I can't remember what it was. it was. Most people said it was great the way it is, perfect the way it is. Almost the entire rest of people said they wanted more analysis or they could do with more <laughs> analysis. And like a few percent said the analysis is too much. That's so pretty I would good. Say, yeah. So I'd say from the, from the people who have found my channel, they're, they're here for what I'm doing. Basically. Yeah, exactly. So ultimately for you, it's the, the paths don't really diverge very much. It's more just the direction your channel is going, regardless of the content. Yeah, I would say the only thing that diverges <clears throat> is, is people just want more videos. Mm -hmm. people, want, people want more videos of the artists they like covered. So mm -hmm. people, um, like lately, because I've, I've been getting into the K-pop scene over the last like six months or so, mm -hmm. um, and those videos usually do quite well, you know, the BTS, the SB19, like those groups. Sure. And I love, I love making content for those groups, but I'm only, I mean, I'm a full-time professional opera singer and I'm in the bass gang and I'm doing the podcast. I'm only putting out two videos a week. Sure. You know, yeah. Two videos a week and an interview every two weeks. And so if I get a thousand suggestions for videos, no exaggeration over the course of a month, mm -hmm. I can do eight. You'll see eight of them. <laughs> <laughs> so like i'm sorry if i'm not getting to your creator more often and i would like to genuinely i would like to i have a, I have a huge list of videos that i am going to do you get a yeah. ton i get a ton of suggestions that don't go on this list right but suggestions yeah. come in the ones that i like will go on my reaction suggestion playlist on youtube and when yeah. i'm recording i just go down that list you know so Every once in a while, your artist is going to pop up, but I can't do a video for Dimash every week. I can't do a video for Morissette every week or Gigi Delana or all these artists that I love making videos for. So I'd say that's the one thing people would have an issue with, but really it's a positive thing. They just want more. They just want to see more videos, you know? Sure, yeah. And dealing with the volume of that, it doesn't really seem to be a major issue. I know people are going to request it and request it and request it yeah. until they see it. And that's fine at the end of the day. But, you know, I mean, like, I feel like some people at some point will be like, if you don't do any more of this, I'm going to quit. And I'm like, are you childish? You're childish. Just it's uh, it's fine. Yeah, He'll get to that, it when he can. That goes in that, you know, tiny subset of people who are mm -hmm. going to be upset about anything. You know? But by and large, I mean, it seems like you've got pretty like unrelenting support regardless of how you organize your videos and in yeah. what order i would say so in what order for sure we're coming close to the amount of time or we're coming close to time so i got a couple more yeah. topics so we kind of briefly touch on and then we'll wrap cool. this boy up great so i've had um a couple of other topics i did want to briefly mention um I don't know if you've experienced this or not, but in the past I have experienced some burnout. Now I don't currently, but I have definitely experienced some burnout um, in the past. So if you've experienced it yourself, what would be some recommendations you may have for any other creators who are feeling burnout? And this is not just limited to our niche. This is across the board for anyone that's in the YouTube industry or music industry. If you have any advice for anyone that's experiencing burnout, what would it be? And if you have had burnout yourself, how did you go about addressing it? <clears throat> yeah, great question. And something that every, every creator is going to face, no matter how much you love what you're doing. Sure. Um, so first of all, as your platform grows, you're going to be dealing with more things that are not part of the creative process. It's like when you first start, you're doing all the editing and you're doing all the shooting and you're making your videos and you're 
you're doing everything and really really a lot of that is is, is the most fun part of it most of that as sure. the yeah as the platform grows then you're in your inbox a lot more emailing you are negotiating sponsorships a lot more you're negotiating guest fees and contracts and all these things and for the most part you're going to be doing that too until you know you get like you know superstar level where you have like a team of accountants and all these things but mm -hmm. very few people very few people get that far so as you ascend you want to just make sure that you're still you're still focusing like your focus still goes primarily into the creative process is the reason you started it right sure so for us you want to keep your energy the majority of your energy going towards making the reaction analysis videos or the interviews or the music videos and then you know when your brain is fried from that stuff do the logistical stuff do the emailing and the sponsorship negotiations and yada 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 sure when you actually get burned out on the creative stuff is obviously a different problem sure and for me personally i mean usually because there's so many different kinds of this is one advantage of doing multiple kinds of things right if you're burned out on reaction analysis stuff maybe you dive in for a couple of weeks on making a music video sure or if you're burnt or if you're burned out on i mean most of what we do is the analysis stuff so if you're burned out right. on that maybe you dive a little you do a few you do more interviews and usually interviews you might be like ah oh, i don't really want to sit down and talk with someone for two hours but usually once it gets going it becomes fun and it becomes a conversation like we're having mm -hmm. right now it yeah. becomes a lot more enjoyable um so i would say that's one thing we can do or creators can do if you get burned out kind of on one aspect of your creativity focus on a different one mm -hmm. if you're if you're feeling burned out on literally everything you're doing if you're just like i just don't want to make any content there are a couple of things you can do. One is you is you truly do take a step back for a little while. <clears throat> you put it all away. You just you consume other content that has nothing to do with your content. Get outside, go on vacation, <clears throat> focus on something completely separate from that. Sure. And then and then come back to it like however however long you need, days, a week. I'd say you don't you probably don't want to take much longer off than like a couple of weeks cuz like you do want to keep your channel running, right? Of course, right. <laughs> and another way, I personally get tons of inspiration. If I'm feeling uh, creative burnout, if I go to a performance or I go to a show, and it could be any show. It could be, it could be I go see someone, a friend of mine perform at an opera. It could be I go to a rave. It could be I go to some other live band event. Usually seeing, for me personally, when I see people performing, it gets me reinvigorated and re-excited about what I'm doing with my artistry and sure. my creativity. And it's cool because you're not working. You're just going and consuming someone else perform, right? That's, sure. that's, a, that's a way for me to get, to get excited about it. So take a step back or focus on a different part of your creativity. Go watch some art. Go consume some art that might reinvigorate your your passion for what you're doing. Um, and also one other thing is have a really detailed goal setting session for yourself. Like figure out exactly what you want to accomplish, why you want to accomplish it, what, what's it going to do, what's it going to bring to your life, and then think about how, <clears throat> how to do it. Sure, so yeah. what do you want, why do you, why do you want it is so critical. What do you want, why do you want, and then how do you get there? And usually a good goal setting workshop will get you really fired up. If I'm like mm -hmm. bummed out about my channel growth and I sit down and I'm like <clears> thinking, of, thinking about getting to a million subscribers by this time and why do I want that and how am I going to get there? That is another way to like really spark your motivation. Absolutely. And I, I kind of experienced that too whenever I rebranded the channel a little bit. You, if you recall, I did um, actually rebrand the channel to Ethan Drew Music over just the vocast. Because yep, I I was smart. starting to, I was really starting to get burnout on the idea of it just being a podcast channel because it wasn't gaining much traction at first because I was like people aren't gonna just listen to some lowly three thousand subscriber channel that only does podcasts every month or something because he's not able to rack in guests and I'm like well I had to really have that workshop with myself and really sit down and evaluate what my actual mission was. And I, it was a, it was a, 
epiphany right then and there. I wanted to cultivate the love for music. And I was like, well, I love podcasts, but why don't I do my own music, do some RNAs, and even maybe do some more fun, interactive music stuff later down the road. Turn this into just a broad everything music channel versus just limiting myself so much that I may limit my own personal success or my own mission. Yeah. Yeah, and, exactly. And just and, re re the comment on the, on the podcast, not growing. I mean, the, the really big podcast channels have been doing it for a long time. Like sure. Chris Williams said, said, I was just listening to it because I love his, I love his podcast, modern wisdom. I think it's phenomenal. Yeah. He was saying that, I think he, he's been podcasting for like seven or eight years now. Mm -hmm. And 85% of like the viewers on his channel came from 2023. Wow. So for the, so the first six years has made up 15% of his total volume. Yeah. So you do it, you do it. And he, he said he, you know, he just grind and grind and grind with no reward for literally years. Like for him, it was like, multiple multiple years where you're getting no return and you're just yeah. putting out good content with no return and then at some at some point it will pay off at some point that cream does rise to the top i literally just last night i got a bunch of sheets of paper stuck them on my wall with duct tape and wrote just keep going in huge lettering because like i because because i know everything i'm doing now is really solid i know my analysis videos are good I know my interviews are good. I know the music I'm doing with the bass gang is good. It just takes time because there are mm -hmm. so many people trying to do it. Yeah, and something else too that this this applies in every area of life lately. Everyone is trying to live fast. I yep. want it done now. I want it done yesterday. And that's something that I have to live by myself is not only to keep going and things, or Rome wasn't built in a day. Just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep if going. The, if the quality is that there are always things to tweak and optimize and maximize, like everyone can improve their craft. Everyone can improve their channel in some way. Right. Mm -hmm. But once you have all those things dialed in, you just keep putting out, just keep doing it. And just and keep fine. going. Just keep going. <clears throat> and there, there is one saying that I, I thought it was cheesy at first, but it really come into play in my life a lot. It's trust the process. I know that yeah, it's, it's very cliche, right? Love mm -hmm. the process, trust the process, but it is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. Because if you are only going to be satisfied by that end goal, you are going to be miserable. And Without that, a doubt. And the satisfaction from the end goal will not last very long because we're humans and that's human nature. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, we're approaching the end of this podcast. I know both of us are about to run out of time. Peter's got to go off and do his thing, and I've also got to go off and do my thing. This is early in the morning for the both of us. And um, Peter, thank you so much for tuning in for another episode on the channel, man. It was great to have you. Thanks for having me, man. Great to chat. Yeah. It's awesome to be able to sit down and chat with friends in the music industry, especially to kind of touch on some things that we feel passionate about and that could use more or more light be shed on. And it's just a beautiful thing. I consider this a blessing to be able to do what I do in the music industry. And it's like I said, thanks for joining me. And guys, thanks for tuning in today. Make sure you like, drop a comment down below if you want to see more of these because there definitely will be more. And in the meantime, if you want to support the channel in a big way, consider looking at the Patreon in the description below. All of my self-plugging aside, I said it twice already, but I'm going to say it one more time. I've got all of his information in the description as well. But most of you, if you're still watching by now, you already know who we are and you already like our content, most likely. But still in the description if you want to go watch or listen. And uh, yeah, that's going to be the end of this podcast. I love you. Take care of yourselves and we will see you in the next one. Peace. Bye.